I was most struck by, um, I think, uh, the obviously the situation being extremely dire um, for, for price of freedom. But I guess what I really found interesting was was placing the current situation post-war in sort of the context of of uh, uh, press freedom in Sri Lanka throughout the last several decades. And, and you know, I, I was trying to reconcile um, Mr. Tisanaikam's comments, which, you know, really got to kind of the, the core mo motivation behind the present government's suppression of press freedom with, with Melinda's comments that, you know, it, it's, it's maybe perhaps not as bad as it was before. And, and I was trying to, to try to, to, to get at what is the, the present reality? It, it, is it really a situation that, um, that the, you know, we, that the country has gone through a war and and uh, you know th this is it, this is a, a slow process, or is the situation now in, in some ways uh, fundamentally worse and, and, and different than, than it was before? Uh, and, and, and just trying to get a, a picture of that that context of how is the situation now as a, as opposed to how it was for the last several decades. Ethiopia is considered a blessing. What's your baseline? What's your baseline? Your baseline is drought. And even a light shower is heaven's gift. That which exists in Sri Lanka today needs to be compared not against the baseline of what was during war. It's perverse. What are you saying? Are you saying that a hundred odd journalists can be killed and that's your baseline to suggest that things are better? Of course, journalists are not being killed. But if you're within the country, you fully and more fully appreciate the context of journalism. And that's also very, very difficult, and I understand the difficulty of understanding the context in the country from outside, because it's this issue of communicating how much self-censorship affects journalism. And I, you know, this you might have a better way of explaining this, but it's very difficult to communicate that self-censorship is right. There are, I can tell you quite honestly, incidents of violence against senior journalists that are not hitting the international media simply because those journalists don't want that publicity. Simply because they feel that by virtue of, say, an IFEX or IFJ or CPJ alert, that their security is even worsened. And so there's actually a lot of violence that is not being reported, but that doesn't mean that violence isn't taking place. There's a structural problem here. And self-censorship is so right that the problem is that the average consumer engages with the media landscape thinking that there is freedom to report. Because that which cannot be said is not immediately evident. And so it's a very strange atmosphere where you would find dozens of FM radio stations, new newspapers uh, almost yearly uh, starting uh, their print run. Uh, extensively new websites by these media institutions coming up. So looking at just the number of channels and newspapers, you would think that things are pretty vibrant. You would think that since there's not been any last since 2009, that things are better. But I wonder whether you need to start with your baseline and whether saying that things are better now gives the false impression that everything is okay. Yes, of course, journalists are not being killed. But let us not forget, I, I think it was a panelist that mentioned that you, you still have the case where a female journalist and her family are held at knife point for hours and are lucky to escape with their lives only to have their house broken into again a few weeks later and having then to flee the country. Now I ask of you, not so much to use that example as emblematic of the rest of the media landscape, but to just examine and ask why that culture of impunity persists, and whether in such a culture there really can be free expression. Well, yeah, in the sense that, uh, as we were saying a few minutes ago, many of the restrictions that have come about has come about after the war, after, uh, uh, yeah, after the war, came to an end. Some of the restrictions on the, of the internet, some of the restrictions uh, on dissemination you know, information through telecommunication networks and internet and so on and so forth, came after the war ended. There was no reason. If, now 
once again, I am not a great advocate on restri uh, on uh, on restriction of the media just because the war is on. I, mean, I think there are certain uh, uh, it has to be very narrowly defined, and if there is a national security threat, it has to be very narrowly defined. You can't just say everything and everything is a national security threat. But but this, but be that as it may, after 2009 May, there has been no violence of the sort that was there before. So why do we why are we having these new laws come? Why is it that journeys are still affected? So I think that is the issue here. The issue uh, of not wanting to uh, deal with dissent, political dissent, people wanting uh, better institutions, set up better government, human rights, and of course very importantly, accountability. Accountability is what we can spoke on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so on and so forth. If you have a vibrant media culture, these issues actually have to be discussed and spoken about. And when you don't have that, you see it, then you, uh, you, you restrict that. And uh, you can go on, you can go on in power. That's the whole thing. Hi, um, my name is Shobna. And um, I was there when the whole Grand Pass mosque incident had happened and everything. And I was following how the, the community was reacting to it and the media was representing it and talking to people on the ground. So I'm curious, Anjana, about the comment that you had made about the, the radicalization of uh, single-use communities with um, how it's developing on social media. I was wondering if you could um, share more about that, if there's any particular themes that are developing, if Tamils who are non-Muslims are also participating. Because um, what I saw on the ground, it was quite complicated. And I, I, when I was talking to people, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about Muslims, right? And which is unfortunate, because most of the time it's not good things. So I was wondering what, what your experience or what, how it's unfolding on social media, and if it's a particular group, I mean, the BBS or who, whatever is dominating it, a particular ideology. Uh, very briefly, and then I should check something more on this. Um, three points. One, as I said, is that it's very disturbing when young people there are, there are individuals as young as 18 going to school. I have no idea whether they understand the level of the issue that they're dealing with, but they're part of these communities uh, and they're partaking in those conversations. There are around eight Facebook groups that are need It's not just the businesses owned by Muslims that are being targeted, it's women and children. The rhetoric, the venom, the vitriol, the thrust of the hate is directed at population increase. And the womb is the locus, loca, uh, the locus of, of a lot of the hate. So it's women, children, and men, but sometimes in that order that a lot of the hate is directed against and towards. Uh, and finally, it's it's that 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 trope that, that late motive for population. And it, it's variously expressed, sometimes extremely sophisticated. You know, the signal is very, very good. If you know, it's not as if it's hate speech that can be easily identified as hate speech. And then you have that, the nut jobs as well. But what's common is that the Muslim population in Sri Lanka is doubling every eight years. And that's variously expressed. These are some of the late motives in all of these social uh, media fora. And then there is often a commonly a call for a resurrection and a protection of the singular Buddhist state. It's always a singular Buddhist state. Dharma Deepa, Dharma Deepa, the, the, the Buddhist island, that is also variously expressed. And the pro problem of researching this and the problem of sometimes reporting outright hate speech to Facebook is that Facebook doesn't want a signal. And you have to have a very good grasp of signal to sometimes understand the underlying, you know, the, the thrust of the message. But this is actually happening, it's happening right now. I am not for a moment saying, may I just end with that, that what you see online is necessarily fueling that which you saw at Grand Pass. I mean, that's a longer discussion. But I'm very, very concerned, I'm very extremely concerned, that the sheer numbers of people participating in this manner, with this frequency, and with this language and expression, might lead to, or at least at, the, at its very, at, at its most, uh, uh, Innocent, in, in a sense, uh, might pose a severe challenge to Sri Lanka's post-war reconciliation.
Actually, we're already there, right? Actually, we're already at an authoritarian framework. So, from that perspective, the, 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 the government's control of the message, the state ownership of the media, the, uh, the, the idea that self-censorship of journalists is kind of a gift to the state, makes perfect sense to me from a, from a governmental perspective or, or authoritarian governmental perspective. So, let's, setting that aside for a second, um, I, I want to ask a question about your larger point, I think, which is this issue of media literacy. Um, what is your diagnosis for why that exists? How old do you think it is? Uh, where did it come from? <laughs> and what is, the, what is the solution? And if there is a solution, does the international community have a, a role in that solution in building media literacy on the ground? Because, I mean, I mean, part of the reason for my question is I remember being in Colombo and people making arguments that were reflected in the newspaper uh, without actually realizing the source of those opinions and the source of where those ideas came from. So it, it, it's almost like because they read it somewhere, it had an air of fact to it without recognizing the source and recognizing the uh, ideological structure behind it. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my question. The problem with Shilak is that he has some ideas. What do you do? <laughs> So people read, man. I mean, you know, uh, people read our newspapers. The, the, so I always make a distinction. Lit, the, the literacy he enjoys is not media literacy. So there was a lot of money going in over the past 10 years, for example, for media development, setting up new media. My contention, my trust, my submission has always been that we don't need new media. We need more understanding of how to engage with the media we already have. The problem is exacerbated, in a sense, by the internet and the web and the mobile. Because today, you have the proliferation and the frequency and speed of media production that influences public physical reaction. You know, Bradman Mirakol, I mean, uh, there, there, was a, there was an interesting, uh, in, by Rajan Boon, writing about the Black July in 1983, the Tamil program, he said very, something very interesting. He said, the violence traveled at around 30 kilometers an hour from city to city. It's a fundamentally interesting statement, isn't it? The violence traveled in 1983 from city to city in Sri Lanka against the Tamils at the speed of the night train or the paper delivery truck. I mean, today it's a fundamentally different landscape. So if you don't understand the media you're consuming, you're going to have more conflict and one more conflict in the future. Where well, I think the international community can help to the extent that they can, want to, as this to say, they're not entirely convinced that they put their money where their mouth is or their diplomatic strategies uh, are entirely coherent in this regard, is by programs to support media literacy in the country, ranging from both journalists in the mainstream media to programs that more broadly flag and highlight the need as citizens in a country to question the media that we consume. And I'm talking literally at also a school level, at a secondary, primary, leading up to tertiary level as well. In the US, for example, there's some really interesting uh, debates currently ongoing on how to incorporate media literacy in the K-12, in the, in, the, in the school public, in the school like, curricula, in the pedagogy. There's nothing of that sort in, in the country. And I wish that, and I'm championing that to happen every single conversation I have with either donor or with trainer or with media institution is to increase the literacy of the consumer or the child. And that's, I think, as parents also something of responsibility, starting with the household as well. Okay. There is no long, there's no short-term solution. Uh, there's no easy solution, but I hope in the longer term, great emphasis will lead to greater critical thinking. Just a quick follow-up. Can a program like that function without interference? In the country. Yeah. It depends on what kind, what nature, what scope, what institution you have. But I'm not saying a black one. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good program. It's a good idea. But, but to me, one of the fun problems is that at least in the North East, yeah. many of the school principals happen to be military, happen to be soldiers, oh, yeah. and, uh, and a teacher, and some of the uh, some of the, uh, the and so, something like that taking place will. Uh, will be very difficult because there's a lot of pushback. So you see, 
this is the whole thing about Wilmer Education. It is there every level. From the school teachers up to the governor of the North Indies, and you get the, uh, the district commander of Jackson telling, telling civilians what to do, how to conduct themselves, getting involved in administrative matters, so on and so forth. So this whole surveillance culture is creating a huge problem. And even introducing a program like this is a very bad idea. I think we'll have a lot of pushback. That's a lot. Form, uh, the possibility for conversations between the communities? I'll give you one very recent example, and it's actually funny to me. Uh, I did a media monitoring uh, study on the coverage of Nigeria's visit to the country. Uh, it's not around this. That's a very interesting study. Um, <coughs> what is traditionally been the case is that in Sri Lanka you have three different words, depending on what the language you get to read. The Tamil language press is completely different than the Sindhu. The Sindhu is completely different in a sense to the English. The English would have a position of being like a wire media, reporting on issues possibly from both the Tamil and Sinhala language press. But if you were only a consumer and only understood Sinhala, you would not really have any awareness or clue as to what the Tamil language press was talking about. I, I often make the example that I, you know, you when I came to the when I came to Boston for the first time and, and, and discovered snow, you know. You grew up, and I grew up reading about snow in deep light and you know, the Hardy Boys or, or, the, or the fiction that you read as a child. Nothing prepared you for the experience of snow. You know, you knew it was cold, you knew it was white, but those, it, it was not an imaginative landscape to acknowledge the fact of snow. The reality of holding it in your hand and making a snow engine. The singular language, media language consumer in the South does not know the realities of the North and the East and that which is reported by the Tamil language press. Period. And this is very clearly seen in just the recent visit of Miss Pillen, where the Tamil language press was the one that was articulating who uh, she went and spoke with, what they went and told her, where she went to, the issues around what she was articulating and pressing the government on, why her mission was important. Basically, if you wanted good reporting on Pillay's visit, you went to Tamil language press. But this was inaccessible to the majority of Sri Lankans in the country. And that's your problem. Because the media divides based on consumers the country. more specifically about um, looking at how you address the single and nationalist majority agenda and like sort of the radicalization you spoke about. And specifically, I wanted to ask, with the incidents that happened in Bellaveria, like there's this line of argument that the only time you're going to get the single majority um, to sort of get on board with like criticizing and critically thinking about the government's actions is when those actions come to them. And, I think that was an incident where those actions did come to them. And even looking at the strikes against the electricity board over the summer, um, and I, I remember reading so many English articles criticizing sort of actions and starting to think critically about what had happened during the war because of the incidents in Velaria. But I'm wondering if um, that translated into the single media um, and whether there's been any follow up on that or whether the critical thinking that was started in those incidents is actually. Um, sort of a phenomenon found in the majority, or was that just like the minority of people who look at those <coughs> Listen, I mean, Bahia was too big a story not to cover there, there was, there is a karma, according to the government, prevented all uh, medical institutions and hospitals from the area from reporting to those who died. So the official death count is possibly much lower than the people who were actually shot dead by the, by, the, by the army. It was too big a story, it was too big a story because it affected, and I, by us, I mean, the same uh, And I was recently talking with some Canadians, it doesn't seem to have hit the media landscape here as to how important an incident that was. I'll come to your question later. 
Because if you recall, there were a number of ministers in parliament in Sinhala suggesting that if this is what Aung could and did do to the Sinhalese, the extent to which the brutality would have extended to the Tamils, particularly towards the end of the war. These kinds of discussions in parliament to be recorded in the Hansard never occurred before Valeri. So in that sense, it was a turning point in, in raising public consciousness about some of the concerns that we have for many months and moons before being articulated around the end of the war in particular. However, the longevity, the sustainability, the long-term viability of Kerry Potter's conversations is still very suspect. For example, most of the mainstream media have now forgotten the issue. The only residual reporting happens occasionally, sporadically, exotically, over, say, the singular blogs, or when a reporter goes back to the area to speak to some victim or a family or who suffered the loss of a parent or whatever. So, for example, why hasn't anybody, I wonder, made the connection between the, uh, the Pope's visit or planned visit to the country and the Catholic Church's condemnation of what happened in the church in Valeria? Why isn't the mainstream media connecting the dots? So you have to wonder whether episodes like this, whereas they raise issues that we are partial to the public consciousness, I mean, it's, it goes back to that earlier question, whether the systemic architecture of mainstream media is not geared towards sustaining these discussions over into the longer term. I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, something that I did for posterity was to catalog every single tweet to be tweeted on many area since the time that it happened. And I feel that it's important because if you don't capture these things for posterity, knowing how ephemeral a medium Twitter is, that some of the discussions around what happened, its implications are going to be lost. This is very inconvenient for government, just the mere fact that an archive exists, but I think it's fundamentally important and it's a small contribution to keeping those discussions alive into the weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you. 